I am going to work on 2014 macro FRQ today. Number one, assume that the United States economy is current operating below full employment level of real GDP with a balanced budget. So below full employment level, obviously, if we are at full employment, it's where didn't do that very well, did I? Let's back up here. It's obviously where aggregate demand, short-run aggregate supply, and long-run aggregate supply come together. This is full employment, but this is also our natural rate of unemployment. So, But if we're below the full employment level, it implies that we are in a recessionary situation, scenario, gap, however you want to describe it. So let's get rid of these. We don't really need this. All right. We have a balanced budget. That might make some difference later on. Draw a correctly labeled graph, short run, long run, yada, yada. Y1, PL1, PL1. Don't forget your PL and your real GDP. This should be Y1. This should be YF. Yep, full employment is YF, Y1, PL1, look like we're good. The government increases spending on goods and services by $100 billion, which is financed by borrowing. How will the increase in government spending affect cyclical unemployment? Understand cyclical unemployment happens when we have a recession, which we do have. So cyclical unemployment would be high. But then when the government spend increases, what we say is cyclical unemployment would obviously decrease. As more people are put back to work, as aggregate demand is shifted to the right with that government spending trying to push it back toward full employment, cyclical employment would obviously go down. Now, this they're asking about the natural rate of unemployment. What happens? Well, obviously a natural rate does not, there's no change in the natural rate of unemployment. So there's going to be no change because all we're doing is pushing aggregate demand back. And the natural rate consists of structural unemployment and frictional. You'll remember that structural is robots, technology, people losing their jobs for that. And frictional is just people moving from one job to the next. Uh, people in college going back to or trying to find a job for the first time or people quitting one job to move to another. This always happens, and that's why both of these are part of our natural rate of unemployment. These are not affected by aggregate government spending or aggregate demand increasing. So your natural rate is not going to change at all. It will stay the same. Cyclical, though, on the other hand, will disappear. All right, let me get rid of this. I think we're good. Uh, so no change here. Cyclical goes down here. C, if the marginal propensity to consume is 0.75, calculate the maximum possible change in real GDP that could result from the $100 billion increase in government spending. So if our MPC is 0.75, that means we know our MPS um, is 0.25, because to together, both of these are going to equal 1. We know to find our multiplier, it's simply 1 over the MPS or 1 over 0.25. So our multiplier is going to be 4. The government spends 100 billion times the multiplier, which is going to give us a 400 billion increase in real GDP. Does that sound good? 400 billion increase in real GDP. Uh, obviously, on a test, you'd want to make this a little, it gets sloppy here because I don't have that much room to mess in. But you'd want to be organized and structured and make sure you label everything and underline or circle so they know exactly what they're looking at when they're grading your test. All right, loanable funds market. I'm going to get rid of this. And... 
Using a correctly labeled graph of the loanable funds market show the effect of the $100 billion increase on government spending on the real interest rate. So understand, loanable funds really could also be just taught, thought about as money in the banks. That's how I think about it. It's money in the bank. It is just a supply of loanable funds upward sloping, demand for loanable funds downward sloping. It is the real interest rate on the vertical and the quantity of loanable funds on the horizontal. Now we go back to what we were doing before. The government is spending. Anytime government is spending, we should just know that the real interest rate is going to go up. Think about this. When the government spends, they're borrowing. And let's just say they're borrowing money from the banks. And we know actually they're selling bonds, but we don't want to confuse that with monetary policy. Just think of it like this. When the government is spending, where do they get the money from? They never take enough in in taxes, so they have to borrow that money. When they borrow from the banks, how does that affect the supply of loanable funds in the banks, the money in the banks? Obviously, if the government walks in and says, I need a billion dollars, and then they leave with it, the supply of loanable funds has to decrease. This is the whole crowding out scenario, too. As supply of loanable funds decreases, it drives up the real interest rate. How would it affect real interest rates? We don't have to explain. We just have to show the effects here. Uh, show the effects of government spending on the real interest rate. There you go. Real interest rate goes up. For D, real interest rate is going to increase. How's this going to affect the long-run economic growth rate? Explain. Understand here that long-run economic growth rate, we talked about this in the past, but we need to talk about it every time. Long-run economic growth is your long-run aggregate supply curve. It is the PPC. Right? It could also be called a potential GDP know that they've asked all of these in the same thing. But think about this. This is the way we would explain it every time. When the real interest rate goes up, how's that going to affect investment? Would you rather take out loans at 20% or 2%? Everybody wants to take out cheap loans at 2%. So when the real interest rate goes up, could we imagine that some people are going to stop taking out loans, that as the price of money, the interest rate goes up, less people take out loans. So that implies investment's going to go down. If there's less investment, could we also say there's less capital formation? Capital formation are one of those six things that increases our long-run aggregate supply, shifts out our PPC, increases long-run growth. So we can imagine that when interest rates go up, investment goes down, capital formation decreases, we would say long-run economic growth is decreased. If they asked about the long-run aggregate supply curve, we would say it's going to shift left. If they had said the PPC instead, we would say the PPC would shift in and then with potential GDP, we would say it's reduced um, or decreases, something of that nature. There's a lot of these questions. So you need to make sure that you recognize what they're asking. And then you have this explanation. The College Board always wants to talk about investment and always seems to have capital formation in there. All right. Uh, F. I'm going to get rid of what we just did. And then we'll do F together. Now, assuming that instead of financing the $100 billion increase in government spending by borrowing, the United States government increases taxes by $100 billion. This is a very trickily, trickily worded question. Because with the next sentence, it says, with this equal increase in government spending and taxes... So you have to sort of be able to read through this and understand that not only is government spending going up by $100 billion, but at the same time, 
taxes are increasing by $100 billion. Now, government spending going up, as we know, is expansionary fiscal policy, and taxes going up is contractionary fiscal policy. They're both the same numbers. You would think they would counteract each other, but they don't. What we tend to understand is the government spending multiplier is, in this situation, we know what it is because we did it earlier on. The government spending multiplier is 4. We do know that our tax multiplier is always 1 less than the government spending multiplier. So in this situ situation, the tax multiplier would be 3. If government spends by $100 billion, we multiply that by our multiplier, we would get a $400 billion increase in GDP. And when taxes are increased by $100 billion, this is contractionary, we would get a decrease in $300 billion of GDP. This gives us a net $100 billion increase in GDP. This question they've asked four or five times over the years. They always like to ask it the same way. They're going to give that exp uh, uh, exponent exp I'm having a stroke here for a second. Um, expansionary fiscal policy and the contractionary fiscal policy with the same numbers. Naturally, you would tend to think that they both would counteract each other and we would just stay where we are. You have to just remember that the multipliers, that tax multiplier, is always one less than the government spending multiplier. All right, guys, good job. Keep working hard. Um, if you want to comment in the chat, just let me know if these are helpful and if you want me to cover something specific, like a specific year, um, just leave me some information. All right, be safe. Take care.